Okay, hello. This is a presentation I've been wanting to put together for some time on Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens has always had a, a, a degree of fascination for me. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a, a trip I took up Mount St. Helens in 2006 when we climbed the volcano while it was erupting. Um, a lot of people know the history of Mount St. Helens in terms of the big 1980 eruption. Maybe uh, you lived through that experience and that event. Maybe it was your parents or your grandparents uh, that were around. But undoubtedly, you know people uh, who who remember that event and probably have some sort of connection to it. And so I thought I'd spend some time uh, looking at some of the, the geologic history of Mount St. Helens, kind of with events that led up to that as well. And so I hope you enjoy uh, kind of joining me here as we kind of just go through uh, Mount St. Helens and just kind of reliving the 1980 eruption, but then also looking at the eruption in the 2000s, which was a lesser known eruption. Uh, didn't quite make the, the media uh, frenzy that the 1980 eruption did, but it was still a significant event nonetheless. And so we'll, we'll just kind of work our way through this uh, as we go. And a lot of these images are from the USGS, which has a great collection of imagery from uh, all different historical eruptions at Mount St. Helens, uh, along with some from the Pacific Northwest uh, Seismic Network. So let's start with um, just sort of looking at the tectonic setting of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens sits uh, here in the Cascade Range, and the Cascade Range exists because we have a subduction zone offshore. So this small ocean plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, is shoved is being shoved underneath the edge of Western North America. And as that plate gets pushed, we go to the top cross section here. As that plate subducts, uh, the ocean crest has water trapped in it, and as that water gets dra gets dragged deeper and deeper down to about 50 or 60 miles. Um, it starts reacting with an area of the mantle no, known as the asthenosphere and the water trapped in that subducting slab actually uh, reduces the melting temperature of this mantle material, uh, allows it to melt uh, at a lower temperature than it might otherwise. That generates the magma and the magma which has less density starts rising towards the surface and feeds this chain of volcanoes that extends from Northern California near Mount Shasta all the way up through Oregon into Washington and into British Columbia. So this tectonic setting is uh, the primary reason we have Mount St. Helens along with the other Cascade Mountains there. And the type of volcanoes that we get in the Pacific Northwest and in the Cascade Range are a type of volcano known as stratovolcanoes. These are sometimes also called composite volcanoes or composite cones. Here's a picture of Mount Rainier uh, and one of Mount Hood, so two of the more iconic mountains in the Cascade Range. And what's interesting about these volcanoes is they're sort of the classic, you know, volcano shape. They're large, these sort of cone-shaped or conical mountains, kind of like a classic volcano shape. But they have an interesting eruptive history in that they don't always erupt the same type of material. They're sort of what I like to call sometimes bipolar volcanoes. They sometimes have uh, quiet eruptions of sticky lava that just oozes out. It's fairly non-explosive. It's not much of a hazard to people in the surrounding region. And then every so often these volcanoes become much more volatile and have much more explosive eruptions uh, which involve pyroclastic flows and ash fall and that sort of thing. And let me switch views here to kind of show you kind of a simple uh, cartoon version of what these volcanoes uh, look like when they erupt. Um, so this will kind of show the bipolar behavior. And this is highly simplified, but it, it, it puts across the idea. So here's maybe an eruptive event with ash that builds up layers of ash on the flanks of the mountain. And then you can alternate that with these other eruptive events, which just produce uh, sticky, pasty lava. There's another eruption of ash, another eruption of lava, so on and so forth. And again, it doesn't always occur one after another, as this animation shows, but that's the general idea. And so you end up with a volcano that is stratified. That's where the name stratovolcano comes from. It has layers. It has alternating layers of ash and lava. And the lava layers are, are very uh, cohesive and strong, and that allows the the volcano to kind of build up to the uh, the impressive heights that they can. And stratovolcanoes are a little different uh, than other types of volcanoes in that they have recurrence intervals of every couple hundred years or so. So 
the big eruptions occur on these things you know every every few hundred years or maybe several hundred years and that's just enough time for humans to kind of get complacent about uh, the danger of the volcano and actually um, taking the volcanic threat seriously and that's definitely true uh, in the Cascades and with Mount St. Helens. This sort of shows the uh, eruptive history of many of the Cascade volcanoes so if we look at uh, the Cascades in the U.S. anyway, uh, collectively from about 4,000 years ago up to today, each one of these little uh, volcano symbols represents a major uh, eruptive event. So we can see that some of the volcanoes like Crater Lake, which actually had a big eruption there, uh, I think it was about 70,000 or so years ago, uh, hasn't done anything in the last 4,000 years. Other volcanoes have had, you know, a couple of eruptions. Mount Shasta has actually been quite frequently uh, erupting during this period of time. Um, Mount Rainier, uh, which is another volcano we should keep an eye on, that we'll talk a little bit about at the end of this presentation. And then Mount St. Helens, uh, by far, over the last 4,000 years, has had m many more, much more frequency of eruptive events than any of its uh, neighboring volcanoes. And so this is definitely the one volcano that we expect to have another you know violent eruption some sometime in the near future pro possibly in your lifetime uh, so you can kind of see the, the the history here of eruptions in the cascades uh, this is a similar one this one's a little bit more confusing we'll start with the diagram at the top uh, this sort of just shows uh, just a simple reconstruction of what Mount St. Helens looked like as it grew. So it's actually the volcano itself is just an amalgamation or the cumulative uh, building of several eruptive events over the last 300,000 years, uh, some of which just ooze out sticky pasty lava. That's what we'll talk about lava domes. There's just, just this massive uh, kind of like toothpaste. If you think about toothpaste being squeezed from a toothpaste, kind of just builds this kind of steep-sided mass. Uh, so, you know, starting out with just these domes or coalescing domes, ultimately building sort of a large mound of volcanic material and then morphing into sort of the classic uh, cone-shaped stratovolcano shape. And then, of course, here's what it looks like following the 1980 eruption. This other graphic here on the left uh, has a lot more detail, a little, maybe a little bit harder to see, but uh, discusses and, and has information on each individual volcanic event that built Mount St. Helens over time. So starting from 300,000 years ago, uh, there was an eruptive event that built up mainly uh, thick lava, this dacite lava. Then there was a period of uh, non-explosivity or non-eruption, non what we call a dormant phase. Then another phase of sort of, you know, all these pinks and purples and kind of uh, lavender colors here are just building the volcano, different stages of eruptive activity uh, interspersed with periods of dormancy. So this is going up through, you know, 23,000 to 4,000 years ago. And then this diagram or this column here on the right showing the last 4,000 years uh, and the eruptive events that have taken place. And so this is a typical behavior for a stratovolcano, periods of uh, activity, uh, sometimes explosive, sometimes non-explosive, interspersed with periods where the volcano uh, is not so active. And what's interesting about this is uh, the 1980 eruption at Mount St. Helens actually allowed us to put this a lot of the details of this together because the 1980 eruption, as many of you know, blew off uh, part of the mountain exposing the interior of the volcano. And it was when we were able to go in and look at these old uh, rocks that were in the interior of the volcano that were able to kind of piece together its chronologic history. So Mount St. Helens uh, before its 1980 eruption was sometimes called the Mount Fuji of the Pacific Northwest. It had the classic kind of cone shape. Uh, it was a, a, a little under 10,000 feet so it was a, a very high mountain. It was capped by uh, several glaciers that kind of came down the sides of the volcano in all directions. Just a really iconic landmark in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and really the uh, first signs of any sort of activity or, or eruptive event started to occur early in 1980. Um, the first events were that there were phreatic or what we sometimes call steam events. And so these were just um, steam driven events probably caused by uh, some of the groundwater uh, being heated up, flashing to steam, and causing just these kind of small explosive events. So at this point, the, the volcano wasn't erupting 
you know, primary lava or ash or anything like that, but it was definitely sh showing some signs of activity in 1980. Uh, and as we worked through the spring of that year, probably the most ominous sign among many others was uh, this very large bulge that started to develop on the north side of the volcano, the north flank of the volcano. Um, it became, you know, not just noticeable uh, to instruments, but over time it was uh, very obvious to just the naked eye. I think this thing became several hundred feet tall. So this big sort of blister or, or tumor, if you will, on the north flank of the volcano. And volcanologists quickly surmised that this was a good indicator that magma was moving closer to the surface and preferentially kind of pushing on the north side of the volcano, causing this bulge, which at times was growing as much as two meters a day, which is pretty alarming. Of course, accompanying this as well were were series of earthquakes. And really, the, the whole thing uh, came to a head on May 18th uh, of 1980. And what happened was there was an earthquake, a 5.1 earthquake um, underneath the volcano that destabilized that north side. So that north side of the volcano, which had bulged and swelled, uh, was a steeper slope, was a very unstable situation. And it got to the point where it finally, uh, with that earthquake, caused this landslide. This was the, the biggest uh, landslide in historic time, or at least documented. Uh, that landslide consisted of two blocks. And I'll show you a video clip of that here in a second. Um, and once that landslide had removed a lot of the uh, mountain that was sitting on top of that magma chamber, which was very close to the surface, that effectively reduced all the pressure, all those gases that were trapped and pent up in the magma now were allowed to freely escape. And this is the event that ultimately triggered the eruption. And so it started out as the landslide, uh, started initiating the blast that came out mostly the side of the volcano, what we call a lateral blast, but then later started erupting uh, a little bit more vertically. Um, and so I can take you real quick to uh, a simple, and these are all on YouTube. You can see uh, these sorts of uh, eruptive things here. But what we'll see here, and there weren't videos at the time, but this, this is a series of time lapse images or photographs that have been pieced together that really document the entire uh, eruptive history of the volcano. And so I believe this is a view looking to the west of the north side of the volcano. These are the only images that exist. Well, let me turn that down. But there's the there's the landslide right there. So there's the mountain basically moving out of the way, uh, releasing some of the pressure on the magma chamber below. Uh, and then as that landslide moves, we see the gases from the magma starting to come out quite quickly. Uh, and right here in the middle, so there's the landslide. And the landslide was moving at times up to 100, 150 miles an hour. Um, we can see that it kind of had a head start. It was actually moving ahead of the main lateral blast from the explosion of the volcano. But what we'll see as we move this animation forward is this lateral blast quickly catches up to the landslide and overtakes it. And it was moving just below supersonic speeds, you know, just around 600 or so miles an hour, just incredible uh, amount of force. And there you can see the lateral blast coming out uh, and taking over uh, the landslide. And then uh, it actually extended uh, well beyond that as well. Um, so these are, there's several of these uh, on YouTube you, you can look at if you're interested. Um, Okay, so um, so there's again the lateral blast, just sort of the, a nice image, kind of showing that. And remember too that you know we're looking at from the base of the mountain to the top, we're looking at over 5,000 feet of mountain. This was a, a large mountain. This is a lot of material. This is just a really impressive uh, eruptive event. And so the eruption in 1980 caused a number of associated volcanic hazards. Uh, the lateral blast, once all the uh, landslide had moved off the mountain. The gases trapped in the volcano uh, exploded, expanded, and produced these big avalanches of hot ash barreling across the landscape. And these are what are what's known as pyroclastic flows. And so these pyroclastic flows can travel at several hundred miles an hour. Uh, the lateral blast itself basically flattened and decimated the forest. So these large... Um, 
you know conifer and spruce trees that you see in the Pacific Northwest were just laid flat and there's all sorts of again videos and documentaries that, that cover this in a lot more detail I'm just I'm, I'm probably just hitting the highlights here but the pyroclastic flows were a huge hazard um, the the summit glaciers melted uh, during the eruption basically all if not most of the ice covering the volcano was melted into water that mobilized it into uh, mobilized it down the valleys and streams that drain off especially the north side of the volcano since the whole thing was directed to the north um, and that produced these slurries of volcanic debris these mud flows that we call lahars this is an indonesian term you can kind of see some of the vehicles in this historic photo on the right there some of the people in the foreground and then look at the size of some of these boulders here just the thinking about the the amount of water and power it took to transport material uh, on that kind of scale it washed out bridges it was all sorts of damage to infrastructure done uh, by the lahars and these were able to travel much further from the volcano than the initial blast area so you had the sort of the the area that was heavily impacted by the eruption uh, the blast area there and then the lahars themselves um, the ash from the eruption which lasted you know a good part of the day uh, took uh, was carried by the prevailing westerly winds and drifted into eastern Washington and beyond. This is a photo from Yakima, Washington, which is uh, maybe a, um, an hour or two east of Mount St. Helens. And this is noon, so you can actually see how dark the sky became because of all the ash in the air. Um, and so you can see how extensive this ash plume was. Um, not just in the Pacific Northwest, but even out into the Rocky Mountain states and a little bit into the Great Plains as well. Um, this sort of shows, this is a simplified diagram showing some of the, the, the devastated areas. So the red is the, the pyroclastic flows, um, which were probably the most uh, explosive and, and violent and fatal, um, but they were fairly confined to just the north flank of the volcano out to about Spirit Lake, uh, the area where uh, the landslide or the debris avalanche, those deposits mainly kind of went down the North Fork of the Toodle River. Uh, and then what the, they're calling the mud flow or the, the lahars that came off of the volcano in different directions. And then this big area here, this was just an area that was affected by that, that lateral blast. That's what was interesting about Mount St. Helens is when it erupted, most volcanoes uh, erupt vertically. And so you can sort of set up a circular... Uh, evacuation zone or an area of impact around the volcano but Mount St. Helens kind of taught us a new lesson in that um, a volcano can actually erupt sideways it can come out horizontally more or less um, and what's interesting here is you, you could have been standing quite close to and maybe I'll switch over to, to Google Earth to kind of illustrate this point a little bit uh, so here's Mount St. Helens here Mount Adams to its its east Mount Rainier, here's the Seattle-Tacoma area, Mount Hood, and Portland's over here. So if we zoom in to uh, the Mount St. Helens area, we can see just sort of the, and this is, you know, uh, many years later, we're, we're nearing the uh, the anniversary of the May 18th eruption. So I guess this year will be, what, the 40, 40 second anniversary of that eruptive event. And you can still see, even with the wet, um, the wet climate that we have in the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest and all the trees that grow there, you can still see how raw and devastated this landscape is even 42 years later. Um, but back to my original point, and that is that the, the lateral blast, which just uh, decimated this area to the north, um, what was interesting to me when I hiked up the volcano, uh, and I'll show this with some pictures later, is as we climbed up the south side of the volcano, you didn't actually see pumice on the ground from the eruption until you were maybe within a thousand or fifteen hundred feet of the summit of the volcano and and what that kind of told me at least crudely is you could have been standing you know somewhere on the south side of the volcano during the eruption in 1980 uh, and been terrified but probably survived uh, there would have been ash fall um, you know you probably would have needed to, to run for cover yet you could have survived this, the eruption on the south side of the volcano and yet at the same time if you were you know five six miles away on the north side of the volcano um, there was just no chance because the, the eruption was directed uh, in that manner so pretty pretty interesting I think uh, some of the lessons that we learned learned from the uh, Mount St. Helens eruption um, okay so what were some things 
some just takeaways from the eruption. There were 57 deaths, uh, over a billion in damage. Uh, the actual summit of the volcano, um, as it erupted, it, it, it was reduced by about 1,300 feet, which is incredible. So the, the mountain itself lost over 1,000 feet uh, of elevation. Uh, and it left behind this huge crater at the summit, this mile-wide, 2,000-foot deep crater. Uh, and so the effects of the 1980 eruption for those who were there during that period were, were, were not to be understated. It was, it was definitely a seminal moment, a memorable moment, in, um, in really in American history at that time. And to give it some context here, um, even though that was a huge event for people in the area at that time, um, in the grand scheme of volcanic eruption sizes, uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption was was kind of medium sized. Um, it definitely wasn't a huge eruption, although it seemed to be quite large and impactful at the time. Uh, and so this is just a simple diagram. We actually categorize volcanic eruptions based on how much um, how much magmatic material it erupts. So the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 produced about a quarter of a cubic kilometer of, of ash, of, of material that was erupted out of the ground. And so if we represent that with this circle here in green, uh, and then look at other eruptions and their, uh, and their sizes, we see that the Mount Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines in 1991 was many times larger, was a much bigger event. And this event actually caused uh, the Earth's climate to cool for a few years immediately following in 1992-1993. Um, Nova Erupta was a volcano in Alaska that erupted in 1912, but because there wasn't a lot of people nearby, uh, kind of largely went unnoticed. Uh, and then we get to these just incredibly massive circles shown here. And these are, well, three of these are related to the last three eruptions of the Yellowstone volcano, or what some people call the super volcano. So the most recent one, 640,000 years ago, uh, produced a thousand cubic kilometers of material. And we can estimate this by actually going out and looking for this ash of this chemistry and this age in all sorts of places, not just your yell near Yellowstone, but out in Kansas and Texas and uh, all, all, any place where the ash would have fallen. Uh, we can measure the thickness of the ash, measure its aerial expanse or distribution, and that allows us to calculate a volume of material. And so even though there weren't humans around, uh, at least, you know, they had the ability to measure the volume of these uh, prehistoric eruptive events, we can still have really uh, solid estimates of how large they were based on looking at the rocks and the, and the sediments themselves. Um, here's the Yellowstone one 2.1 million years ago, which was the biggest of the three. Uh, and then there was an even bigger eruption in Indonesia at Toba about 74,000 years ago, um, which was even a little bit bigger than this Yellowstone one, which is pretty incredible. This one has a neat little side story to it by looking at um, DNA uh, diversity in uh, humans. Um, there's uh, there's some evidence that suggests that this eruptive event 74,000 years ago uh, caused the number of individuals in the human race to actually decrease to maybe only a few thousand or so. So in essence, what I'm saying is there's some evidence that suggests that humans almost went extinct because of this massive eruption and the climactic effects that it had in Indonesia uh, this many years ago. When we look at, and I'm not a biologist, so take take this and, and maybe find a better, better source for it. But basically, when we look at the amount of diversity that humans have, there should be a lot more genetic diversity than what we have. And that's because there's this actual bottleneck there. So it's humans were evolving and diversifying, but then it all shrank down to a few individuals, less, less, you know, less genome and genetic diversity there, and then it expanded like from there. So this event seems to have something, uh, something to do with that, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, something that the biology world had kind of known, but then the the geologists were able to kind of put an event and tie that together a little bit. So what happened after the uh, May 18th, 1980 eruption. Well, uh, we had this huge devastated landscape in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but then what happened over the next six years is with most of the gases released during that major eruptive event is there was still some residual magma left behind, but magma that had lost a lot of the gases dissolved in it. And so that gas 
or excuse me, that gas pour magma actually welled up into the crater, the floor of the of the volcano and oozed up like sticky toothpaste to form a series of what we call lava domes and so here's one from 1981 so this just looks like a pile of rocks but what this is is this is actually magma it's not the type of or lava this isn't the type of lava you see in hawaii where it's red hot and flowing this is lower temperature lava um, it has a little bit different composition and so it tends to be a lot more sticky so instead of flowing downhill uh, maybe miles and miles it tends to just ooze out again like toothpaste pile up on itself and it forms these topographic features we call lava domes um, here it is by 1983 there's it's a little hard to tell but there's two people down there to give this some scale so this is you know several hundred feet tall and, and maybe uh, uh, several thousand or so feet wide um, these lava domes become very unstable so they become so steep that they occasionally have a rock fall and they tend to collapse a little bit here we are by 1985 uh, so the the dome kept building um, kind of coalescing on itself oozing out in one place maybe oozing out in another but ultimately had built a large pile of, of rock that cooled and crystallized or the lava cooled and crystallized into rock. Uh, and then from 1986 or so, uh, the volcano went to sleep. It basically became a dormant volcano with non-eruptive um, activity. And this graph that shows earthquakes kind of shows us a little bit. So this is uh, time from 1980. This one goes up to about 2012. And then the circles here, the size of the circle, the bigger the circle, the bigger the earthquake. Um, and then this also shows the location of the earthquake underneath Mount St. Helens. And notice, in, so we can kind of see in 1980 um, that these deeper earthquakes were probably early in the year when the magma was rising and then all these shallow earthquakes were you know there there's your eruptive activity and then as we go from 1980 to about 1986 we can see that most of the earthquakes are shallow because this is where the lava is coming out of the ground into the crater forming that dome remember an earthquake is nothing more than rocks breaking so for that lava to get to the surface it's got to it's got to push its way through fractures and cracks in the rock uh, force its way into some space and in doing so that generates these these earthquakes most of these earthquakes are quite small in terms of their 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 magnitude or sizes these ne weren't necessarily felt uh, but they're picked up by the instruments by the seismographs uh, the seismometers um, so we can see again mostly shallow earthquakes while it was erupting and producing the lava domes uh, and then as we go from 1986 to 2004 we see that most of the earthquakes are deep um, and there's little pulses in here around 1990, another one here around 1998 or so. Um, but notice that the, there's not much of a surface component to these. And so these are these sort of indicate magma coming up from below and then sort of pooling up into the magma chamber. The magma chamber uh, is believed to be about two kilometers uh, below the volcano. And it's only when we see these big chains of volcano or earthquakes uh, heading to shallower levels that that's more indicative of an eruption and so you can see the big spike here uh, in late 2004 uh, going on to 2008 and so we're going to look at that period of time um, but in the meantime during that 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 dormant stage uh, in the late 80s and 90s and early 2000s we remember we have this big crater that opens to the north at Mount St. Helens we get a lot of snow in the Cascades and so this was actually a cool opportunity um, with the earth heating up over the last you know several decades most glaciers in North America uh, have been shrinking and melting but by forming this crater after the 1980 eruption this allowed snow to accumulate in this little uh, crater here largely protected by the sun because of the steep ridge there the sun's uh, to the south this is the north side here and so over time uh, that snow accumulated uh, eventually compacted into glacial ice and formed a glacier and they've actually uh, formally named the glacier it's called crater glacier um, but this glacier is uh, up upwards of 300 feet uh, 
thick in places and it's actually the only one of the only gr growing glaciers uh, in the US because it's still uh, accumulating snow uh, and advancing and during some of the little animations I'll show later you actually see the ice moving uh, a little bit so that was kind of a, a nice little I guess benefit or, or a perk I suppose to the 1980 eruption was uh, the formation of this new glacier so as we go into 2004 um, we can see September 22nd, 2004. Uh, this is just uh, earthquakes in the region. Uh, not a lot of earthquakes happening. A day later, there's a significant uptick in seismic activity and energy. Uh, and then if we go a couple days later, the seismometers are just going ballistic. And all of this, of course, is indica indicative of uh, these shallow earthquakes uh, indicating magma is moving closer to the surface. Uh, and this all culminates in early October 2004, uh, an explosive event. And so there was an eruption within the crater of Mount St. Helens. This did actually show up on some of the news feeds. Uh, you could see it from Portland. Um, it was kind of a little mini, I wouldn't say it was as big as 1980, but definitely a bit of a, a media uh, event and so you can see all the the news agencies there kind of watching St. Helens uh, as it was uh, erupting and so it erupted ash for a number of days um, you know and everyone had remembered 1980 and so this was like well is it going to erupt again that sort of thing but the what the volcano did here was it actually that initial blast was just kind of uh, releasing some of the gas charged magma that had built up in the volcano but it wasn't nearly as much as what was in 1980 so it was a fairly small explosive event that didn't produce uh, much in the way of you know any sort of uh, hazards or anything like that and then what took place over the next four years was that sticky pasty lava started oozing up into the crater now as i show you some of these pictures uh, during the daytime you're just going to see gray rock and that's not going to look super impressive but it not, you have to remember this is lava it's just cooler than your hawaiian style lavas it's not nearly as hot um, and so it doesn't incandescently glow unless you look at it at night so this is actually uh, the glow of the lava uh, from the crater at night in November 2004. So there's our old uh, dome that was generated in the 80s from 1980 to 1986. That's the lava dome uh, that formed during that period of time. And here we are in 2004 looking at a new dome. So between the 80s dome and the, the crater wall itself on the south side, uh, lava started oozing up towards the surface and forming a new dome. And remember, this is how these stratovolcanoes form, just periods of of extrusion of lava, uh, maybe an explosive event here and there, but this is how these these volcanoes can actually regenerate uh, some of their their lost mass during the big eruptions is by filling in the spaces with all this lava here. Um, you can see here uh, some of the sulfur. You can see the patches of yellow and the cracks and the steam and the gases coming out of this this fresh lava, this gray rock here called dacite. Um, this is the lava dome over here on the right, and this is actually part of that glacier. So the, the, the poor crater glacier, which had just barely formed and was kind of kind of getting its act together, was seriously deformed as the lava dome pushed up on the glacier. It caused that ice to crack and break and actually get tilted and uplifted here. So you can see that ice kind of forming a big slab here, a little dusting of ash uh, on the surface there, which kind of really lets you see how this thing is oriented. Um, so at times this uh, lava was pouring out of uh, the vent to form these domes at a rate of like seven to eight cubic meters per second. Um, and to give you some, some scale on that, the, the volume of a cement truck, the big mixing trucks you see that, that have the cement, um, that's about eight cubic meters. So basically this thing every second was pushing up uh, a cement truck load of lava every second which is really impressive so the, the it was definitely cranking out a large amount of lava but again because it was so uh, sticky and highly viscous uh, it didn't flow very far it just sort of oozed out of the ground and as we'll see here in a second it kind of came out of the ground like a, like a piston almost um, so here's again just giving you some context how big these lava domes uh, were or are for football field to cross um, again, because they were prone to collapse, uh, they, you know, this one was nice and smooth. This one was called the whaleback. 
actually they named this one um, but because they become over steepened they can actually collapse on themselves you can see a little a scar there from where this lava this rock has collapsed and formed this pile of rubble here you can also get a good view of, of the the crater glacier and how this dome came up right in the center of the glacier causing the glacier to flow and to form around the rising uh, lava dome there uh, this is just a quick little sequence it shows uh, so focusing on this area here, these are all from remote cameras they set up on the volcano where they could just take pictures and snap pictures all day. Uh, so before the rockfall event, uh, there's the rockfall event itself. You can see the plume of, of, of dust uh, and a little bit of ash maybe mixed in there as well. And then here's that section where you can see the obvious section of rock missing from the dome uh, and then all the debris that spread out on the glacier down here. Um, Again, just the, how smooth these surfaces were. You can see the sulfur, so some of the gases coming up with the lava, forming these sulfur deposits there. Just a really incredible and dynamic landscape. A uh, little view from the air of the whale back there, the, the dirty, dusty glacier kind of forming around it there, 2005. Similar view here, there's the, the first dome, and this was, I think, the second one that came up more or less next to each other. The glacier with the crevasses that sort of thing and then this actually is a nice little time lapse that'll show uh, the glacier form or the dome forming from 2004 so you can see the main focus and remember this is lava just being pushed up like a piston forming a dome here it's going to shift though a little bit to the north and form this sort of spine here uh, this is the I think this one was the whale back this kind of smooth feature but then you can see it collapse um, get over steepen and collapse Going into 2005, more more lava extrusion, uh, and then as we as it came into well that one doesn't go far enough, but as we went into 2006, it actually slowed down quite a bit. This is a similar view, but looking at it from above, um, down on the crater, and so here you can actually see the the dome forming. Um, you can actually also see the 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 glacier flowing around it. Um, but this sort, the old 80s dome, and then these new domes in the in the mid 2000s that were forming in the Mount St. Helens crater. Pretty remarkable uh, that we were able to capture all that. And so to conclude this presentation, uh, in 2006, just as a little personal note, uh, a friend and I uh, climbed the volcano. It was closed to climbing in 2004 and 5. They thought it was unsafe, but by 2006, uh, it seemed like the volcano was was fairly stable. They weren't worried about a an eruptive event or something uh, you know explosive happening and so they opened it back up you had to get a permit uh, you also had to take uh, some safety equipment so they um, required that you take not only a helmet uh, with you up the volcano but also a mask like a the kind of the kind we wore during COVID like a respirator uh, so you're not breathing in some of the ash or some of the gases that were up there and so the the hike begins here at climbers bivouac uh, and then once you clear the trees uh, it follows this ridge here known as Monitor Ridge uh, up to the summit. And so it's about, it's a little over 5,000 feet of elevation gain. It's, it's a good workout. And this is, again, on the south side uh, of the volcano. So here's, here's we, here we are the morning of, kind of starting our hike, looking at what's ahead of us. Uh, here's the sun coming up, you know, the patches of snow. It was a pretty warm day. Um, here's one of the GPS stations that the... The, one of the monitoring stations on the mountain. So this actually relays in real time to scientists like how much the volcano is moving, not just up and down, but east, west, north, south. So they can continuously see what the flank of the volcano is doing and if it's deforming at all. Um, here's my friend as we got a little higher. So by this point here, we're quite a ways up and you can see in the foreground here under his feet, some of the, the, the small kind of light gray pumice. This is all from the 1980 uh, eruption, the ash and the pumice that fell on on the on the flank of the volcano. But again, we're pretty close to the summit, um, and this area I think was was probably somewhat survivable um, during the eruption. Maybe a little bit lower as well, but um, not nearly. You would have fared much better here than if you'd been on the north side of the volcano. Uh, maybe a thousand or so feet to go. So at some point, it just becomes kind of a slog up through the rocks and debris, not much of a discernible trail, and that's the crater rim up there. Uh, so here we are a little bit closer. Uh, there's me at the top, um, and the crater is just down here to my left. It was kind of a, 
a low visibility day. The wind was whipping around. Uh, it was kind of hazy out, uh, but we did get a nice view into the crater of the lava dome that was formed at that time. And uh, luckily, while we were up there for an hour or so, we got to see part of the lava dome uh, actually collapse. Uh, and we kind of heard this rumble and looked down and part of the lava dome had collapsed. And, you know, uh, the rocks had kind of fallen onto the, the slopes below. And so just a cool event just to be there at that time and, and you know, take a, partake of a, a small dynamic geologic event in real time. So what's, what's the future of uh, Mount St. Helens? Well, um, well, let me go, let me actually go back a little bit. So you might wonder like, well, what, what are we doing? What, what's, the, what's the future of Mount St. Helens? Well, obviously this is a volcano that we monitor uh, quite closely. Um, and so this is actually uh, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. These, all these little dots here are earthquakes that have occurred on Mount St. Helens or under Mount St. Helens in the last two weeks. And so the earthquakes are still monitored. They monitor the gas emissions, just gases seeping out of cracks in the rock under the volcano, the slopes of the volcano and any, any sort of tilt changes in water levels and wells. There's just a, a whole host of um, parameters that are monitored. And so any volcano like this, um, we can't necessarily predict exactly when it's going to erupt, like the day and the time, that sort of thing, but we can definitely forecast eruptions. We knew in the 1980 eruption that it was definitely trending towards some sort of eruptive event at some point. We didn't know the day and the time per se, uh, but we can definitely tell when volcanoes are, are kind of heading that way and possibly going to erupt. And so to conclude, um, you know, what, what's next? What could happen at Mount St. Helens? Well, it could, it could go back into another phase of, of creating domes and filling in the crater with domes. Uh, there could be another explosive eruption. In fact, I think the longer we go with nothing happening at Mount St. Helens, the more likely that event would be because we would have uh, gases, dissolved gases in the magma, uh, rising towards the surface and the longer those gases stay trapped under the volcano the more that gas pressure builds and could ultimately produce uh, some sort of eruptive event. We could also you know continue on for decades uh, maybe even a hundred years or so without uh, an eruptive event but I think if anything if we look at the history of Mount St. Helens and how often it's erupted over the last 4,000 years it's very likely that it will have some sort of eruptive phase uh, you know, within the next 50 or so years. Um, I don't know what the, the estimates would be on that, but it, it is it is somewhat likely. And we also need to remember, too, that even though Mount St. Helens is the most active of the Cascade volcanoes, it's really the one of the least dangerous. There's not a lot of people living uh, near the volcano itself, uh, n not a lot of large population centers, uh, and some of these larger volcanoes that are closer to people like Mount Rainier um, are much more dangerous. Mount Rainier has an incredible amount of ice and snow capping its summit. It's a bigger volcano by, shoot, uh, four or five thousand feet. Um, and an eruption here wouldn't even have to be a major eruption, but if you had an eruption that mobilized some of this uh, ice, it turned it into water, uh, and that went draining off all the flanks of the volcano, uh, that could be a pretty significant event. So I hope you uh, enjoyed this presentation on Mount St. Helens, um, just kind of giving a perspective of what happened in 1980, what happened in the mid-2000s, and then a little look at uh, maybe what's to come in the future. So appreciate everyone for tuning in. Thank you.